have just passed over the main passenger terminal. And you're heading west out of the passenger yards. You've got a glimpse there in the foreground of one of our blue comets, a state set. And there is the orange and black monster, which, going with its four passenger cars, was christened some time ago by John Marin, who called it the Bridgeport Special. This is one train which has caused a lot of conjecture in the fraternity as to what it is, who built it, and where it came from. And the only comment that I can make on it is that I don't believe anyone will ever have its origins resolved with any degree of certainty or finality. We are leaving the passenger yard lead flying over the Hellgate Bridge, running out over through the Mountain Division, and here we are flashing back again, looking towards one of our mainline areas. Another small way station, and a town serving our very busy populace. Approaching us on the right here is the beginning of the mountain and an operating ski run, which was imported from the west zone of Germany. The skiers are carried to the top of the mountain on the chairlift and actually disengage themselves sliding off down the ramp. Now the track gang that you see there is busily doing some repairs as our copter flies over one of the farm scenes of the layout. Incidentally, this was where the boys of the crew first started scenicking. And here in the corner, as we're proceeding west, we find a Lionel power station camouflaging one of the corners. Our main city, Grant Town, christened by my ever-loving vice president in charge of the president, my wife Emily, and a bit earlier there, you got a glimpse of one of our many classification yards. There's an American flyer freight busily engaged in serving the industrial area, encompassing an air, uh, three tables. Incidentally, the layout occupies an area equivalent in size to four full-sized bowling lanes. The basement area is 28 by 56 feet by 28 by 18 and covers 2,100 square feet of floor space. You just saw the blue comet go by, and here's a 402 hauling a dozen or so 500 series freight cars. Lionel never realized how good an engine they had in that 402, that we have had that particular locomotive in a pulling test haul no less than 50 mixed 500 and 200 series freight cars. That's a Voltamp car body on the left foreground there. Our only piece of Voltamp equipment on the layout, we use it for a facsimile of a diner under construction. One day prior to our installation of automatic controls on our lift bridges, that American Flyer Freight went headfirst off an open bridge off the 40-inch table down to the concrete floor, be floor below. I can hear the groans now. You can imagine what I expected to find when I went over to pick up the pieces since all seven cars went over after the engine and tender. Much to my surprise, the only damage done was a broken pilot beam on the cowcatcher of the engine. 
As I said earlier, the layout occupies an area equivalent in space to four full-size bowling alleys. We have approximately one half mile of operational track. All of the main lines are solid brass T-rail laid on individually mounted ties. That the switches which make all tracks interconnected are all built in place by hand and there are 65 of them all controlled from the central control panel. Over there on your left is another view of the orange and black Bridgeport special. Incidentally, as I said, these pictures were taken just prior to the 1964 Boston Convention and the time limit given to us to produce them was rather short. So consequently, we did not have sufficient time to uh, dust the equipment prior to photographing it. So please excuse the dust. Another shot of the terminal. The two pieces in the foreground are homemade, a inner urban car, which I made as a boy, and a diesel locomotive in front of the small num number 10 there. A couple of the 381s that we have floating around. Incidentally, both of these state sets are different. One set has pickups on all trucks with a drum head reading it's Continental Limited on the observation car, and the other has standard pickups on one truck with the conventional Lionel Lines Limited. The engine on that Bridgeport Special there is articulated in five sections, has 20 wheels and three motors in it. The C&E began in 1957 when we moved our home from C&E number three began in 1957 when we moved our home from New Haven to Norwalk. And I soon realized that if I was ever going to get anything operating in the manner that you see here, I was going to need some help. So I tried to recruit the assistance of one or two adults beside myself to work on it on a one night a week basis. Unfortunately, there are no TCAers relatively nearby to Norwalk, and I tried my best to uh, talk to neighbors, friends, and the few relatives which I have in the immediate area to get someone to work on the layout with me on a one night a week basis. I was willing to underwrite all costs involved, but in spite of my best blandishments, I couldn't convince anyone how any adult could get any fun out of playing with trains. Nevertheless, I began working on it myself, and after I had been active for a few months, I hit upon the idea of recruiting youngsters who were my age when I got my first toy train, 10, and teaching them the hobby of model railroading. I began with one boy, it wasn't long before I had two, and before you could say Jack Robinson, I had 15. We set up Friday night as a operating night, or as a work night, and we started a program of beginning at 7 o'clock and working through till 10. From 7 to quarter after 9, we were actively engaged in working on the layout. From 9.15 to 9.30, the superintendent of dining cars, who also happens to be the vice president in charge of the president, and who also happens to be my ever-loving wife, Emily, uh, prepares soda and cookies for the entire members of the crew. And then from 9.30 to 10 o'clock, those that are qualified engineers are permitted to run trains. Naturally, the object of any new boy who 
joins our operations is to reach an engineer's ranking where he can actually control this equipment as it goes around the layout. The success of this particular program is witnessed by what you're looking at. Fully 95% of everything on display, be it the laying of track, the building of scenery, the construction of switches, the laying of ties, the wiring of the layout, installation of relays, everything has been built by youngsters ranging in age from 10 to 15 under my supervision. That I'm quite apt to get a boy when he will be 11 or 12, for example, and after he's been down here for a few, uh, or excuse me, I'll come back to this. We have passes for all of you nice people, and if you've all signed your releases to the railroad, our copter is now going to land us in front of the main terminal. We will go inside and board the locomotive for a trip around the layout inside of the cab. Are you ready? All right, here we go. Well, as I said, I'm apt to get a boy of new boy of uh, 11, 12, or 13 years old. And after he's been with me for a few months on Friday nights, he's quite apt to say, you know, Mr. Peeper, I can't imagine anything which would keep me away from Friday night train club. My answer is, well, I hope you always feel that way, but I know very well that he won't. Because after he's been with me for, oh, three or four years or so, he's gotten to become a fine mechanic, he can install a relay or fix a switch machine with a little supervision. And he amazes his parents as to what he can do with tools. He is quite apt to suddenly discover that girls and dances take place together on Friday nights. And when this happens, I don't try to stop him. You just can't compete, believe me. So I lose another experienced man, and we have to recruit again. Unfortunately, the recruitment is getting more and more difficult as the work gets more and more complicated. And whereas our membership once was 15, uh, it is now six. We're swinging around out of our passenger lead now, coming into our tunnel entrance. out of the tunnel back onto the westbound main. We're swinging up the mains now. Have a 381 bearing down on us on the left.
I suggest, in case there is a little difficulty of synchronizing the tape on the projector, that the projectionist make a point of running the projector at as slow a speed as you can, keeping it just off the flicker stage. Here's another shot of the Bridgeport Special and a state set standing by as our camera train moves around. As we swing down the northbound main, our 402 set is holding for the camera special. We're moving quite slowly so that you can assimilate all of the uh, detail work which has gone into the creation of this track work. It's an American Flyer switch tower we just passed there. One of several units which have been donated various times by New York area collectors. Past our little local station past our mountain and our track gang again. Past our power terminal. We're now on the eastbound main. The first time we came through here, we were on one of the two large passing tracks which are on the layout. Our main lines are double tracked in their entirety. We have these two large passing tracks which the permit the operation of more than uh, two or three trains on any given track at any given time. That our operation is virtually limitless that we can go in either direction on any of the tracks at any time, provided, of course, we clear them in advance. And we can run, thanks to the new relay installation where our signal bridges actually control our trains, three or more trains on one track at the same time in the same direction, irregardless of their individual speeds. Our maximum operation at the present time with one man control safely is six trains that uh, with two man control we can put eight into service. When uh, we complete one additional stretch of track we'll be able to run nine. When these pictures were taken there was one rather large stretch of table which was uh, incomplete yet, and uh, which has been filled in the last two years by a five-stall roundhouse capable of holding 400 E's, which is served by a large operating turntable capable of holding 400 E's. A uh, beautifully detailed coaling station is in this locomotive servicing area built by one of the boys, as was the roundhouse. And uh, a electric locomotive repair shed is about 90% completed. We're swinging through the classification yards now, past a weighing scale here where you see a cut of cars being humped up for checking through. 
past the yard main tower. And we're going to have to hold here for a second while an inbound freight clears to permit our camera train to move out. one of my boys that you got a glimpse of there. Neither my wife nor I have any children of our own. And although we love kids, we uh, have anywhere from three or four to 15 or so on any given Friday night. Since these pictures were taken, literally dozens and dozens and dozens of bushes and shrubs have been built by the youngsters and planted on the layout using cuttings of privet hedge for the substance of the trees and uh, glued on lichen for the bushy leaves, or leafy leaves, bushy leaves, listen to me. That's another one of the youngsters. We're swinging back out of the yard and just about completed our tour of the main yard areas. Another shot of the mountain in the background, the ski run on the, s the ski slope on the side. And here we've come out of the mountain there's a door fan crane, fully operational, believe it or not. Back across the Hellgate Bridge. Back into track four. Where you will depart from the left side of the cab, please. Now we'll take a few moments to show you around the walls of the basement, the remaining of the display collection, which we sometimes alternate with what is on the track. You're looking at American flyer equipment in the past two scenes. This is Ives. Down on the bottom there, you see the Ives orange and black cars pulled by, the line of Ives transition cars pulled by a 9U. Oh, we don't have a 3245. We're still looking, just like everybody else. Complete set of line of Ives freight cars, American Flyer Ives freight cars, and back here is our Lionel garbage department, pre-World War I stuff. Well, actually, we broaden it up into the pre-World War I, post-World War I period. There's another one of our blue comets. The 390E Blue Comet behind it. This is all Lionel. From the golden age of standard gauge.
The c &E owns nothing in any other gauge other than the standard gauge. And when we do locate something which might be of particular interest to someone in other gauges, we invariably dispose of it uh, to interested parties that we know of might want it, or if it has some peculiar personal interests, such as uh, unusual jewelry in railroad and uh, uh, that type of memorabilia, it goes to the collecting half of the C&E crew, which is my wife, Emily. Now, we hope you enjoyed your trip that we might say in conclusion that the C&E stands for the first initial of my middle name, Carl, and the first initial of my wife's name, Emily. And we, Carl and Emily, thank you for your kindness in looking at it, hope you enjoyed it, and do want to wish you all a very pleasant visit to Norwalk should you ever be around here at any time.